Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to take a look back at the 2024 tornado season and see how the forecast we released back in February fared. 2024 has been a very active year, the most active tornado-wise to this point since 2011, and the spring severe weather season played a big part in that. In this video, we're going to analyze how the main factors that modulate U.S. tornado frequency and distribution during the spring progressed throughout the season, and what impact this had on tornadic activity in the U.S. during the March through June timeframe. We'll then go month by month through our 2024 tornado season forecast and compare our predictions to what actually happened to see how well our forecast did this season. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. As you may remember, we looked at three main variables that modulate tornado frequency and distribution in the U.S. each spring. The progression of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, Gulf of Mexico sea surface temperature anomalies, and drought in the elevated mixed layer source region. I'll put a link to my 2024 tornado season forecast video in the description box below so you can refer back to it for more detailed information on these factors. Let's start off with the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. As a refresher, ENSO refers to the sea surface temperature anomalies in the region of the Pacific Ocean that lies along the equator. Colder than normal sea surface temperatures in this region represent the La Nina phase, while warmer than normal sea surface temperatures in this region represent El Nino. ENSO influences the jet stream. The El Nino phase often leads to a more muted, southward shifted jet stream, whereas La Nina tends to yield a more amplified jet stream, which can be more favorable for severe weather, including tornadoes in the US. However, research from Lee et al. has shown that instead of focusing on the individual ENSO phase that's present through most or all of a given tornado season, Looking at how ENSO phase progresses throughout a season can be more helpful in determining tornado frequency and distribution in the U.S. Back in February, we were in a moderate to strong El Nino that was expected to shift into a neutral and perhaps weak La Nina phase by summer. This most closely matched Lee et al.'s early terminating El Nino progression, which tends to feature heightened tornadic activity from the central plains into the Midwest, as well as in the southern plains, particularly in April and May. This ENSO forecast ended up being pretty accurate as our three-month running average of equatorial Pacific sea surface temperature anomalies decreased rapidly into the neutral phase by around May with continued decrease into June. The next modulating factor we analyzed was sea surface temperature anomalies in the Gulf of Mexico. Based on research by Molina et al., when Gulf of Mexico sea surface temperatures are warmer than normal, the air mass that gets transported northward into the U.S. is more unstable, increasing the potential for severe weather, including tornadoes, while the opposite is true for cooler than normal Gulf waters. We went into March with a mix of anomalies in the Gulf of Mexico, but in an overall sense we were near or just above average. In our tornado forecast video, we mentioned that it was unclear how this might progress, but that we expected at least average to above average sea surface temperatures to persist through June. This is exactly what happened. By mid-March, the pockets of cold anomalies had disappeared, and widespread warm anomalies would permeate the Gulf through the remainder of the season. By June, Gulf sea surface temperatures were well above average as a whole. Finally, we discussed the impacts of drought in the elevated mixed layer source region out west. Drier, hotter conditions on the higher terrain of western Mexico, the desert southwest, and up into the Rockies can yield stronger elevated mixed layers transported eastward atop the low-level moist layer. This means stronger capping that can preclude severe thunderstorm development, so less drought in the EML source region can be more favorable for severe weather out east, including tornadoes. To start the season, the picture wasn't too concerning. The area from southern New Mexico into west Texas was struggling with extreme drought, but it was fairly localized, and elsewhere in the EML source region, drought conditions were fairly modest in their extent and severity. Long-range outlooks showed drought persisting across the desert southwest into west Texas, but it did not seem like this would negatively impact EML strength going into the spring, and this ended up being the case as little change in drought conditions occurred from March through June. Now let's see how our 2024 tornado season forecast performed. Remember, our forecast was for tornado frequency and distribution across the U.S. for the March through June time period. Taking into account the expectation for generally favorable conditions among our modulating factors and several analog years, we predicted an above-average tornado season in the U.S. with two main potential hotspots, the Southern Plains encompassing Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, as well as the region from the Central Plains into the Midwest. To start the season, I expected March to be active toward the beginning, followed by a slow finish, with most of the early activity focused in the Central Plains, shifting toward the Gulf Coast to end the month. What models were predicting to be a fairly active jet stream to begin March did not come to fruition, and tornadic activity was much more limited than I anticipated through the first week or so of the month. Providing over half of the month's total tornado reports, March's only true outbreak occurred from the 13th through the 15th. The event started off with a well-documented tornadic supercell near Alta Vista, Kansas on the 13th, which acted as an appetizer for the following day. 
On the 14th, supercells produced several tornadoes, some significant across Indiana and Ohio, in somewhat of a surprise event, with other sporadic tornado activity from Texas to Illinois that evening and across the southeast throughout the morning of the 15th. Other than a bit of activity across the central and southern high plains on the 24th and a few other isolated events, the remainder of March was quiet in the tornado department, finishing with a below average 67 tornado reports for the month. Overall, our forecast for March was a bit off, with mostly sporadic activity and no real hot spots emerging other than perhaps the Midwest, which was driven largely by the mid-month outbreak alone. Our forecast called for the relative quiet of March to continue into early April before tornadic activity picked up toward the back half of the month, in particular across the Southern Plains, the Mid-South, and the Midwest. April began with back-to-back -back significant tornado risks. The corridor from Oklahoma to Illinois was under the gun on the 1st, while the threat increased and shifted east into the Ohio River Valley on the 2nd. These two days produced nearly 100 tornado reports combined, including multiple significant tornadoes in Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and West Virginia on the 2nd. However, we subsequently entered into a bit of a lull across most of the country as expected, outside of a couple days of elevated activity along the Gulf Coast on the 9th and 10th. As we moved into the latter half of April, we saw another multi-day outbreak with 48 tornado reports during the three-day stretch from April 16th through 18th. After multiple tornadoes on the morning of the 16th across eastern Kansas, tornadic supercells developed both near the surface low in eastern Nebraska and south of the warm front in Iowa and Missouri, the latter regime spawning a high-end EF2 in far southeast Iowa. A few tornadoes would occur in Ohio on the 17th and in the general vicinity of St. Louis on the 18th. A week passed before the beginning of another outbreak sequence, the most notable of the season and one that would kick off an extended stretch of hyperactive tornado activity. 164 tornadoes occurred over the four-day stretch from April 25th through 28th, with the 26th coming in as the most active day. 77 tornadoes, including several significant, occurred on the 26th alone, mostly across eastern Nebraska into western Iowa, including the Lincoln Waverly Nebraska EF3, the Elkhorn Nebraska EF4, and the Minden Iowa EF3. The onslaught shifted south on the 27th with 57 tornadoes, many of which occurred after dark in Oklahoma, including the Sulphur EF3 and Marietta EF4. The sequence came to a close on the 28th with several tornadoes from the Ozarks down to Texas. After a down day on the 29th, activity would pick up right where it left off with the start of another multi-day outbreak sequence on the 30th, featuring multiple tornadoes in northeast Kansas, including an EF3 near Westmoreland, and a somewhat surprised tornadic supercell in southwest Oklahoma that produced an extremely large and intense tornado near Hollister, along with an unusually long-lived anticyclonic one nearby. This closed out a month in which we saw 384 tornado reports in all, which is well above average, and many of these were concentrated in corridors from the Central Plains into the Midwest, the Ohio River Valley, and the Southern Plains from Kansas to Texas. Our forecast accounted for this, as well as a late month uptick in tornadic activity fairly well, so I'm happy with our April forecast overall. As mentioned previously, the end of April spurt was not an isolated event, as May turned out to be a hyperactive month for tornadoes with an incredible 571 tornado reports and 496 confirmed tornadoes in total, over double the monthly average. We expected that this would be the case based on our ENSO progression and analog years. May started off hot with several mesoscale days that produced tornadoes in Texas, the most notable of which was the high-end EF3 that slabbed homes near Hawley, Texas on May 2nd. We transitioned into more synoptically evident events soon after, beginning with a high-risk tornado outbreak on May 6th that included the devastating Barnsdall, Oklahoma EF4. The threat shifted east the following day with a handful of significant tornadoes across Michigan and Ohio. May 8th saw the outbreak sequence continue with a vengeance from the Ozarks into the southeast, with several damaging tornadoes across Tennessee and a couple EF3s in northern Alabama after dark, among many others. The outbreak came to a close on May 10th, rounding out the event with 174 tornadoes across numerous states. Near daily activity continued through the remainder of the month with several notable outbreaks within that stretch. The central and southern plains were under the gun on the 19th, including a well-documented supercell that produced multiple tornadoes as it tracked toward the Oklahoma City metro area after dark. Then came May 21st, which saw several tornadoes take aim at the Midwest, including the historic Greenfield, Iowa EF4 in which mobile Doppler radar measured winds that potentially exceeded 300 miles an hour at the surface. May 23rd was another big day with a bunch of tornadoes across Nebraska and Iowa and a photogenic yet intense tornadic supercell in southwest Oklahoma. Tornadic activity somewhat underperformed during the May 25th moderate risk until after dark, when supercells produced intense tornadoes from North Texas into Oklahoma and Arkansas, including an EF3 that demolished a travel stop near Valley View, Texas, an EF3 that killed two and injured 23 near Claremore, Oklahoma, 
and a nearly two-mile-wide EF-3 that traveled from northeast Oklahoma into northwest Arkansas. May 26 continued the onslaught with a whopping 73 confirmed tornadoes split between early morning activity that had persisted from the previous day and widespread new development in the afternoon. Like the previous day, the latter regime occurred within a moderate risk, and once again, several significant tornadoes occurred, this time from the Ozarks into southern Illinois and Kentucky. Things would quiet down synoptically for the remainder of the month, but the tornadoes still kept coming. Several southern high plains mesoscale days rounded out May, the most notable of which provided strong tornadoes near Midland and Sanderson, Texas on the 30th. Overall, our May forecast fared well, with a well above average tornado count occurring across a very broad area, including places like the Southern Plains, the Midwest, and the Mid-South. Finishing up our forecast period was June. We expected May's hyperactivity to persist into June with a continued focus on the Southern Plains and Midwest, as well as some action creeping into the Northern Plains. This proved true to start the month, particularly on June 2nd, when an expansive severe risk across the entirety of the plains produced a smattering of tornadoes, most notably in the southern Texas panhandle near Silverton and across the Dakotas. The 5th saw the most tornado reports of any day throughout the month with 29 spread over several areas. Even though it wasn't necessarily in our forecast area, a localized outbreak occurred across far northern Virginia into Maryland, and additional tornadoes occurred across the Great Lakes in Midwest and down in northern Mississippi and Alabama. After this, tornadic activity was fairly sporadic with a lack of higher-end outbreak days. A few tornadoes occurred in the forests of northern Minnesota on June 12th, followed by a handful in Illinois and Kansas on the 13th. An MCV triggered tornadic supercells in northeast Nebraska on the 15th, and the Central Plains remained the focus on the 20th with a few tornadoes from southeast Wyoming into Nebraska. The upper Midwest added to the tally on the 22nd with a localized area of tornadic activity in northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin, including a few tornadoes in the Chicago suburbs. Nebraska and Iowa continued their active seasons on June 25th, featuring a surprise high-end EF3 in the Nebraska Sandhills near Whitman. Overall, our forecast for where June's tornado activity would take place wasn't too bad, with the corridor from the Central Plains into the Midwest remaining a hot spot and scattered activity across the southern High Plains, but our call for an above-average June fell flat, with only 166 tornado reports and 122 confirmed tornadoes, well shy of the climatological average. So that's going to do it for this video. I know there wasn't a ton of new content in this video, but I think it's important to go back and analyze where our forecast went right and where it went wrong so that we can improve on our forecasts in the future. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how our forecast fared, especially for April and May. Our expectation of an above average season definitely came to fruition, and the Midwest and Southern Plains saw quite a bit of activity as expected. Hopefully, next year's forecast can be equally, if not more, successful. I'm interested to see how the modulating factors evolve going into next spring. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.